Greetings, this is Dr. Seth Ward, and this is a brief PowerPoint about modern Judaism. These slides will go from early modern until the 20th century. They don't really bring the story up to contemporary times, and we're going to start in Eastern Europe. Poland became the largest center of Jewish life in early modern times. In the year 1500, uh, Poland began to witness a large influx of Jews and within a relatively short time was one of the largest centers of Jewish life. An outstanding representative of Poland life was Rabbi Moses Isserlis, often called the Ramo, uh, commentator on the Shulchan Aruch. Shulchan Aruch was written uh, by uh, Joseph Caro, who was born in Spain in 1488, moved to what is today Greece, and then to the land of Israel, lived in Safed. The Shulchan Aruch appeared in the uh, late 1500s. Within a few years, <coughs> Israelis had written a commentary. Uh, the Shulchan Aruch is a kind of summary of Jewish law. It really has never been replaced. Almost all the Jewish law books today uh, are based on the organization of the Shulchan Aruch. The Shulchan Aruch itself was based on the organization of the tour, which was written in medieval Spain. Having said all of that, Caro represented the Spanish Jewish tradition. Rabbi Israelis gave the Northern European tradition. Uh, Jewish life in Northern Europe is often called Ashkenazi. Ashkenaz was the medieval Hebrew reference to the, the Rhineland, and today the term is used to refer to Jews who are uh, descendants of Jews who lived in the area from a little bit west of the Rhineland in northeastern France all the way east to what today is Russia. The Kingdom of Poland-Lithuania expanded. It expanded into what today is Russia and Ukraine, and in in fact, the story of pushing back the Polish invaders, as the Soviets and the Russians and the Ukrainians call it, is an important trope of the 1600s and led to the Chmelnitsky massacres of 1648 and 49, which had a tremendous impact on the Jewish community. The community was somewhat self-governing. Uh, by the 1580s, there was so-called Council of the Four Lands, four regions within Poland, Lithuania, and they governed an awful lot of internal Jewish life. The slide refers to Sabatian influences and to the Maharal of Prague. Uh, the Maharal of Prague uh, was responsible for many, many stories and uh, commentaries and religious law and so on, but it's probably best known for a kind of uh, fictional account which circulated about him creating a golem, a clay individual who saved the Jews of Prague. Uh, it had the word emet written on its forehead. It could not speak. Emet means the word truth, and uh, the Maharal eventually uh, caused the golem to stop working by erasing the aleph that word is met. Um, this the modern Israeli pronunciation. Emes and mes uh, would be the uh, Ashkenazi pronunciation. Uh, mes means dead. Or, uh, and uh, the story goes that the uh, corpse, the clay corpse, as it were, of the golem was kept in the Altenai Shul, in the um, major, major synagogue in Prague for centuries. Shabtai Tzvi was a messianic pretender, as we sometimes call them, who became a Muslim in 1666. He was born in Smyrna, uh, Izmir in modern Turkey today, and was active in the Eastern Mediterranean. He died in, um, in uh, what today is Bosnia, I believe. Uh, the followers of Shabtai Tzvi believed that he was the Messiah. He had some uh, uh, 
uh, alternate ways of imposing Jewish law and breaking Jewish law in order to bring, to liberate sparks from Lurianic Kabbalah, a whole different discussion. A number of responses to early modernity arose. Probably the most important one was secularism. Uh, and response to secularism uh, included, first of all, the idea of Hasidism. The Hasid is the person who uh, is pious, that's what the word means. And the idea of Hasidim goes back a long, long time in Jewish life. The Maccabees are some, were sometimes called Hasidim, apparently, pietist. That's 167 BCE. And various other groups call themselves pious. It's also used to refer sometimes in Jewish literature to saints and to other pious people, and certainly to Hasidei Umot Olam, the pious people of the nations of the world. Israel Baal Shem Tov died in 1716, was a charismatic leader. Uh, he served God with joy and with song. It is a very religious movement, but it's also one that emphasized the joy of studying and dancing. Uh, uh, this would be men dancing around the Torah, things like that, not social dancing. Uh, and serving God always with joy emphasized charity and support of the poor, uh, emphasized the wonder-working rabbis of the community that gave advice to all sorts of people who were needed advice. Uh, and needed advice. And uh, they were, the re a response to them was the Mitnagdim, the Elijah Gaon of Vilna who died in 1797, he was a Kabbalist, and he was a great commentator. He's responsible for great works in Jewish law. But he, and especially his student, Rabbi Chaim of Volozhin, uh, transformed the traditional legalistic approach to yeshiva study, study in academies, and a, a life that was uh, much more oriented towards uh, study of Torah than to, you might say, the uh, community life of joy. Uh, I wrote on the slide that Ray Shindland, in a sur brief survey of Jewish history, wrote that the Hasidic movement has emerged recently as the most visible traditionalist force in Judaism. That's largely through the work of the uh, Lubavitcher Rebbe, uh, the last one, the seventh one, uh, Menachem Mendel Schneerson, who died already a quarter century ago and through the emotional power of a small number of other Hasidic movements, for example, the Bratslav or Hasidim's followers of uh, Nachman of Bratslav. Uh, there are also uh, traditional non-Hasidic movements who have imported some of the same approaches. The Enlightenment slowly reached into Eastern Europe one of the results, again, this is the secularism, which is probably the most important part of this idea, one of the most important response was that both Hebrew and Yiddish prose writing emerged as an important literary out, um, output. Some of, these, some of this writing were things like newspaper reports and the creation of uh, drama and poetry and literature and fiction and uh, other nonfiction as well. Uh, Hebrew had always been used for a certain amount of business between Jews and also especially for religious works and now it was used for all sorts of things. Some of the most important writers of the 19th and early 20th centuries were Mendele Meuchers Farim who died in 1917 and the somewhat younger Sholem Aleichem uh, whose real name was Shalom Rabinovich uh, who died in 1916. Uh, they wrote in Hebrew and in Yiddish and sometimes in Russian as well, and eventually Yiddish emerged as a language for this type of literature. Um, Sholem Aleichem's stories about Tevye Milchig or Tevye the Dairyman were immortalized in a 1960s uh, musical, Fiddler on the Roof, which I'm sure is familiar to many people. The um, 
important writer, S. Ansky, uh, wrote a play called The Dybbuk, or Between Two Worlds, Worlds, a play that was both traditional and folkloric and very modern. Uh, Ansky wrote the work and one in which basically love conquers even the rabbinic world uh, through the medium of a dybbuk, a kind of disembodied spirit of a dead lover inhabiting his beloved uh, uh, in putting her into a trance and a very emotional end of the story she as it were joins him in the afterworld on the one hand as I said it's very folkloric and uh, it appeals to the uh, some of the traditions of Eastern European and Central European fairy tale stories but it's very modern and, and very passionate in a way that is really not all that well known in the rest of Yiddish Jews could only live in Poland, Lithuania, er, uh, the areas of Poland, Lithuania, after about a half to two thirds of Poland was absorbed by Russia, the other parts by the Austrian, Austrian Empire, and by the Kaiser, the uh, Prussians, who eventually became the German Empire. Uh, the situation developed over the 19th century. The, by 1795, Poland had been totally partitioned. Uh, even in the beginning of the 19th century, the beginning of this period in which much of Polish Jewry was living under the Tsar, um, there were prohibitions from cities. Odessa was an open city. It had recently been conquered from the Ottomans. But for most of Russia, including St. Petersburg and Moscow and the large cities outside the Pale of Settlement, Jews were prohibited from living there. Under Nicholas I, Nikolai uh, I, there were Cantonists. Uh, the czars basically stole Jewish children from their families, inducted in the army, had them serve for 25 years. There was pressure to make them Russian Orthodox, those who succeeded in retaining a Jewish identity and settled in some of the large cities because as veterans of the army, they had a uh, license to do so, uh, began to develop a very different part of Jewish culture as well. There were new patterns of schooling. The most important thing that happened though uh, in Tsarist history for the Jewish studies was that the assassination of Tsar Alexander in 1881 touched off anti-Jewish actions, regulations, May laws, and pogroms. Uh, at this point, in part because of these pogroms and in part for other reasons, a massive exodus of Jews from the areas controlled by the Tsars stream Jews into Western Europe, England and France, uh, parts of Germany, and especially to the United States. A very small but extremely important strand went to the land of Israel, and that's part of the Zionism story. Extremely important group, although relatively small in numbers compared to the uh, number of Jews who went to the West. In Germany, the Russian Jews were called Ostjuden, and they were ostracized by some of the German Jews for whom the Enlightenment and science had created a very Western European lifestyle. The Ostjuden were still much more traditional, much more poorly educated overall. There are lots of upheavals in the early 20th century. The Kishinev programs in the 19, early 1900s inspired another wave of migration out of Russia. This one had an extremely important effect also in the growing Jewish community in the land of Israel. Again, uh, my note indicates that poverty and the increased access, lower price for travel, uh, was also part of the reasons for these migrations. 
There were other responses, conversion to Roman, uh, to Russian Orthodoxy in, in Poland, or to Catholicism, socialism, communism, Zionism, labor movement, and many others. The Soviet Union started in 1917, and at the first, at first, they had an idea of having many national groups. But very quickly, uh, the Stalin era saw the rise of anti-Semitism in Russia, the de-Judaization of Yiddish, and towards the end of Stalin's life. There were, there were very concerted efforts, the doctor's plots and the uh, killing of uh, 13 Jewish activists in August of 1952 and so on that led to a very difficult time for Jewish identity. There were also very much intermarriage, much more than was in the United States at that time leading after communism 1991 and especially with the migration of many Russian Jews out of the former Soviet Union to places like Israel and uh, Germany and the United States led to a number of issues with uh, mixed families and how they would identify as Jews and whether the communities would accept mixed families in the lands of their resettlement. During the late 19th and early 20th century, several cities emerged as being places with the most important Jewish populations. Warsaw, Vilna, this is in Poland, Odessa and Moscow in Russia, New York in the United States. These are cities with enormous Jewish population centers, vibrant culture stretching from Hasidic and very religious to totally secular with theaters and um, uh, musicals and so on and so forth. Uh, after World War I, Poland as a country reemerged with a thriving cultural life and three million Jews uh, with many, many large centers, not only in Warsaw, but in Lublin and Lodz and Krakow and, and many other places. <laughs> 